Hey everybody, welcome to The Office Field Guide, a show I made up because I love The Office. I'm Chris and I'm reviewing every episode of the series here and today we're in for a treat because today we are looking at the job. The job. The job. The job. The job. The job. job. I get the job? The job. Did in my job. The job. For that job. For the job. The job chance job. For the job. The job. The job. My girlfriend's job. My job. Full-time job. Corporate job. The job. The job. Give me this job. Boob job. The Job is the finale of season three. It is the second hour long episode of the season, which means we have a ton to talk about. And if you haven't noticed, I'm in my new studio, which is not my, it's not a new studio. It's the same studio. I, I just sat right here, the camera. Innovation. <laughs> Let's get to the stat sheet. The Job is an episode produced by series veterans, written by Paul Lieberstein and Michael Schur, and directed by Ken Quapis. It first aired on May 17th, 2007, was viewed by 7.9 million people, and currently has a 9.3 out of 10 on IMDb. Every week I aim to give out a trivia question that you might know if you just watched the episode. So your trivia on the job is, what is the name of the corporate HR rep that David Wallace can't stand? And don't forget to keep an eye out for the hidden prison mic or floating Andy in this episode. Be the first to put the right answer in the trivia and the first to put the timestamp of the Easter egg in the comments and you'll get your name in next week's video. I'll be moving the winners to the credits from now on, so stay tuned for that. I guess I'm gonna also have to add this to every video, but spoiler warning. Warning, warning. Which is normally the case for most of my videos, but all the more today. So with that, let's vet this one out. No one uh, asked you anything ever. First thing we got to talk about is the Flannery told the TV Guide that they did table reads for this at the Beach Game shoot, which honestly sounds like a blast. And if you haven't watched the table read for the series finale, I highly recommend it. But one of the most interesting things I read about the job was that the ending was kept really secret. They actually shot different endings so that the cast wouldn't even know how it ended. I've read that Fisher was unaware that Krasinski was going to interrupt her during this talking head, but that seems not true at all. I couldn't find anything to confirm this. So if it is true, I'm sure she's gonna talk about it in her podcast when they get there. Similar to the last several weeks, this episode has a crazy amount of deleted content on the DVDs. I'll leave a link in the description for the full video, which is 12 minutes long, but the original cut of the job was an hour and 12 minutes. That means there's 22-ish minutes that we've never seen. This is one of those episodes I wish there was a director's cut for. But in those deleted scenes, there's a great bit where Creed attempts to manipulate the Shroot currency, Kevin's investigation continues, a lot more rising about Pam's beach outburst, and a delightful scene that shows a near finished paint job of Michael's office. The fact that there's so much deleted content is a testament to what I've heard so many folks involved with the show have talked about. That there's always so much more story written, shot, and edited for this show, but a ton gets cut out every episode. And I've got to speed things up here, so rapid fire. I've seen speculation online that this girl is Katie. I've all but confirmed that she is not Amy Adams. This is one of my favorite Jim Dwight bits in the entire series. Welcome to the hotel hell. Check in time is now, check out time is never. Does my room have cable? No and the sheets are made of fire. It's shot like a typical Jim Dwight cold opening, which gives more credibility to those cold openings, as though this is kind of just a daily thing that they do. And does it make anybody else's OCD flare up when Dwight puts this plaque on the door? I mean, it just bothers me. But moving on, this is a great bit. www.creedthoughts.gov.www backslash creedthoughts. Check it out. You can find this on the Wayback Machine, I'll put the link in the description. It's best used on a PC, I think. I've read some of it. Even for the internet, it's pretty shocking. And I also love this. Michael is gone. Hail to the chief. Big League Chew is the best. But if you're not familiar with it, it's just gum. There's no reason to spit. Also, I had some up on my thing. Big League Chew. I just, I think there's awesome commentary there with Dwight thinking that he's now arrived, so he's got big league chew. There are two great callbacks here. First in the past. If Dwight ever asks you if you accept something secret, you reply, absolutely I do. Do you want to form an alliance with me? Absolutely I do. Good. Good. Excellent. And then a future callback to this episode. Michael is gone. There's a new sheriff here in these offices, and his name is me. Conference room, 10 seconds. Okay, 
Everyone, conference room, right now! Yeah! Woohoo! And since we're in spoiler territory, when I interviewed Nicholas D'Augusto last month, he told me the spill was not on purpose. And I'm glad we all we all just kind of picked it up and Hunter starts helping her with the box, but it was all kind of a wonderful, happy accident. And uh, you know, it's fun to, whenever I see that scene, I always laugh about knowing that that was just like a totally random occurrence and it absolutely makes the scene, it makes the button of that scene. Oh, thank Don't you. let them change you, okay? And we also talked about how there's something more probably going on than just their professional relationship. For more on that theory, go check out Chad Nish's video on the topic. Uh, links in the description. Here's what Nicholas said about that idea. Certainly they were banging. And uh, I can't imagine he was going to be smart enough to do anything about it. And uh, we know that she was mentally unstable at the time. So, you know, we, uh, who knows, man. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to let the thing live out there. I'll tell you that. And another great thing from that scene, this is the first time I can think of where someone else is the cause for the bleep button instead of Michael. So long, Michael's face-saving speech when he comes back to the office is so painful it hurts me down deep in my bones. I am going nowhere. In fact, he does a ton of saving face in this episode. Let's talk about it in the deeper meaning. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? The job. This is an episode where I wish I could see the director's cut. I think there's some really deep and complex writing happening here. So let's just start with the surface idea of a job. We can see that Michael, Karen, and Jim, and Ryan, are going out for the same job at corporate. Michael thinks that he's a shoe in for whatever reason, so much so that he took a loss on his property. I already sold my condo. Michael. Why? But we find out later that he was never seriously considered for this position. Jim and Karen, on the other hand, are both well suited for this job, but it seems like Wallace prefers Jim. I'm assuming that because of this in the cocktails episode, this in the deleted scenes of Beach Games, that shows Wallace pursuing Jim about the position, and I think it's clear that Jim probably withdrew his resume from consideration. Hopefully more tactfully than this. Do you accept my withdrawal? I do. Good. Very good. I am glad we are finally on the same page. Karen had a pretty solid interview, but Wallace still went with Ryan. So maybe it was Ryan this whole time? I don't know, but I love this side glance. But beyond that job is the boob job. And look, neither me nor, in my opinion, The Office are making a positive or negative statement about breast enhancement surgery in general. In this case, it's commentary on Jan's self-destruction. <sighs> that was some serious, hardcore <laughs> self-destruction. Yeah. I kind of feel bad for her though. Don't. I'm guessing that the surgery is solely a play to win Michael back as he had these four concerns about her in the women's appreciation episode. Breasts, not anything to write home about. Insecure about body. I'm unhappy when I'm with her. Flat chested. What was the last one? She's totally flat, shrunken chesticles. And Michael is instantly won over. Your advice was good, but Jan's was bigger. But this idea of winning someone over is actually a motif throughout this entire episode between the three characters trying to win over Wallace, Andy trying to win over Dwight, and Jan trying to win over Michael. They're all looking for a job or a role to play out. In my opinion, this episode is making it clear that Pam is confident, joyful, and doing her best to live her best life, even if that life doesn't involve Jim. But those who are bothered that Pam intentionally or inadvertently broke up Jim and Karen, BFD, engaged ain't married. Quapis said that he really wanted to be careful how he presented Jim throughout this entire episode. He didn't want him to give anything away. And I think Krasinski really killed it, as well as the rest of the cast. And saving the reveal of what was actually said at the Beach Games outburst is masterful. This whole end sequence, actually, is masterful. If you don't know where this is going, Pam is resolute in her conviction that she's gonna be okay. Meanwhile, Jim is getting reminder after reminder that he belongs in Scranton with Pam. Dunder Mifflin, this is Grace. Sure. And when Wallace asks him this, Long haul, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Maybe it's just me, but I'm always yelling with Pam in my head. And while Karen is not an antagonist character at all, and honestly, I really do appreciate how relatively faultless she is in this entire arc, but it is her passive aggression that might have sparked this entire outcome. Before I leave tonight, would you mind making a half a dozen copies of Jim's and my sales reports for interviews tomorrow? Uh, sure. Thanks. 
She's clearly making copies later in this episode, so this was just a subtle reminder of Pam's place. Pam used that to slip the note in, which by all means is not a love note. It was just a sweet reminder of what he had back in Scranton. I mean, Kevin. But you know, she finds her own Gumby-shaped man in the future, so it all ends well for Karen. I think that the deeper meaning here is a look at what is shallow versus what has depth. Dwight's currency is empty, his lecture is useless, and his leadership has no depth. Even his aspirations are not aspirational. Yeah, but I haven't told you my salary yet. Go. $80,000 a year. Andy's degree has no meaning or usefulness. I was just a Cornell grad in anger management. Look where I am now. Not bad. Kevin's busy vetting out insights for Jim that he will never use, but it's in the choices that are made in this episode that we get to see this theme play out. Jim chooses Pam because of the depth and history that they have. Wallace chooses Ryan because of the depth he assumed Ryan's MBA has. Michael chooses Jan because of the depth her bra has. So the message here is choose wisely. Three major life altering choices are made in this episode. Only one proves worthy in the long haul. You? you came up to my desk and you said, this might sound weird, mm -hmm. but that mixed berry yogurt you're about to eat has expired. That was the moment that you knew you liked me? Yep. You are everything. <laughs> or I don't know, maybe this whole episode exists as foreshadowing to the dinner party in season four. Hi, Hunter. Bye. Oh, good luck with your band. Jan thinks Hunter's very talented. You know what? I don't think he's that good. At least he's an artist. BFD, I'm a screenwriter. But with that, let's dish out some dundies. And then I gotta get him to the dundies. The dundee for the most award bait episode goes to the job. Good night. Okay, this is really hard for me to get through. It won the Writers Guild of America Award for the best screenplay in an episodic comedy and the Primetime Emmy Award for outstanding single camera picture editing for a comedy series. In addition, Jenna Fisher received a nomination for the Primetime Emmy Award for outstanding supporting actress in a comedy series. So it really did do well out there with awards. Anyway, the Dundee for one of the most iconic moments in the series goes to Jim's date proposal. I'm sorry, what was the question? Just gives you all the feels. But with that, let's rate this thing. What gives, what? What gives you the right? All right, the cold opening. I'm gonna give this one a three out of five. There's not a ton to talk about here, but I do think it's a good way to start this episode in a way that curtails addressing Pam's outburst and it delays that a little bit. Steve Carell and Andy Buckley are great. Michael is crazy awkward, but this is such an underrated line. The other branch managers are total morons. Hey, Pam, yeah, I forgot what day the interview was and I drove to New York accidentally. Be like three hours late. All right, so for the job's overall rating, I debated about this one going back and forth between two scores and I ultimately landed on five out of five. This is definitely on my list of top episodes of The Office. As just a comedy episode, it's phenomenal. While at times its central acts can feel like it's made up of just random bits, those bits are pure gold. This episode does a great job of setting up season four with Michael and Jan's dysfunction, Ryan's ascent to corporate, Jim and Pam's dating relationship, and Dwight's dismantling. But as it is, the job works super well. As an hour-long episode, the pacing never seems bogged down, it's high energy, and the comedy never takes a backseat to the drama. And the drama is all throughout this episode. I will say that it does leave one thing to be desired, and that is the subject of this week's episodes we were robbed of. 
I believe that we're left to assume that Jim called Karen and broke up with her prior to this date proposal. We were robbed of an episode in which we see how Jim broke it off with Karen and how Jim and Pam's first date went. Will They Won't They's always create an interesting hook for a series. So it takes a lot of courage for showrunners anytime they make a move like this. Personally for me, I like Jim and Pam as a couple more than I do in their Will They Won't They stages. But that's just what I think about this episode. What are your thoughts? I actually have a lot more to say about this one, but it's going to be part of my season three wrap up. And that is next week, so subscribe if you're not. Uh, we're going to be looking at all of season three. And if you're new and you haven't watched any of our wrap ups, we'll be talking about some of the high level insights from this season. We'll be talking about the broader, deeper meaning of the various arcs throughout the season. And my personal favorite, we're going to dish out some dundies for the different categories like best and worst episode, cold openings, cringiest moments. And I'm also looking to put together something I'm calling unsolved mysteries from season three. So to help me make decisions about the best and the worst, I've started polling folks on my TikTok account. I'll probably also be putting some polls here on YouTube. I'm filming this in advance, so I might have already started that. I don't know. Time is weird. You can check out my community tab uh, to see what I've already posted or what I haven't. Uh, but with that, that's all I've got on the job. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.